Right. Uh, so we will be starting uh, on time. So again, thank you for joining me for this uh, informal teaching session. So basically, what I wanted to do is just uh, for the first few weeks, just go through cases. Uh, all of these cases are the cases that I see in IDN in 2022. So I have uh, made the name anonymized, obviously. And uh, this is just a teaching, so just a theoretical teaching. Uh, please don't use this to, uh, you know, as a direct guide on how to manage your patient. So uh, we will start with the first case. And then after that, uh, I will also will try to give you some, uh, some uh, learning uh, point. So our case number one uh, is this is a 57 years old male. So I see this patient, he come, all come with a complaint of exertional shortness of breath. So this is the parastinal long axis view. So if you can see that this is the interventricular septum, this is the inferolateral wall. So this is the echo image that we always see and the first image that we see when we do our echocardiogram. So what we will see here is we see the symmetrical increase in wall thickness. So very important to see that the interventricular septum is thickened and you can see that this is thickened and that is thickened there. And more importantly, if you look at the right side here, you can see a turbulent flow across the left ventricular outflow tract. And you also see a turbulent flow inside the left atrium here. So this looks like a Y-shaped turbulent flow here. Okay, so when you look like this, for those of you who are familiar with the cardiogram, whenever we see an increase in wall thickness, the question in our mind is to ask two questions. Does this patient have hypertension, number one? And number two, does this patient have aortic stenosis? Because those can cause abnormal increase in wall thickness. If let's say the patient does not have the two of those, the three next commonest conditions are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, number one. Number two are uh, uh, cardiac amyloidosis, and number three are Anderson's fibrin disease. So in this situation, um, because this patient have dynamic LVOT obstruction, this is most likely to be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Though in a rare cases, you can have patient with amyloid or patient with uh, fibrin disease with dynamic LVOT obstruction. Okay. So I just wanted to show you. Uh, this is a little bit special. Uh, that's why it's going to the case. Because if you look here carefully during systole, it is not the anterior mitral valve leaflet that go into the interventricular septum, but it's actually the posterior mitral valve leaflet that go to the interventricular septum. Okay, So this is the posterior systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. So the posterior leaflet that go and obstruct the left ventricular outflow tract during systole rather than anterior mitral valve leaflet. So why does this happen in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So this happened because the increase in wall thickness caused a turbulent flow here, and this pushed the leaflet towards the interventricular septum. That is one of the reasons. So the other reason, sometimes in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the papillary muscle is actually displaced epically, and as the papillary muscle displaced epically, it actually moves the anterior leaflet or the posterior leaflet towards the interventricular septum. So that's are the second reason why this patient can have dynamic LVOT obstruction. And the other reason is that the mitral valve leaflet itself for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy tend to be longer compared to normal patient. Okay. So I just wanted to show you another view. So this is the apical long axis view, again showing the posterior leaflet sample. And this is the apical four chamber view, again showing nice picture of the posterior leaflet sample. And as typical with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the patient have preserved ejection fraction with ejection fraction of 60.3%. So sometimes people ask if the patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they have preserved ejection fraction, why do they have shortness of breath still? Mainly there are two reasons. Reason number one is because the wall is very thick. You know, because the wall is very thick and we know that the coronary arteries actually go on top of the left ventricle wall. So because the wall is very thick, the small arteries cannot pierce the wall enough to go to the endocardial layer. So that's one of the reasons, ischemia. The other reason is because thick wall, so they are not able to relax normally, and therefore the patient have diastolic dysfunction. And these two reasons, one is very increased thick wall and ischemia, and number two is diastolic dysfunction. And finally, the LVOT obstruction itself, 
can also cause symptoms of shortness of breath and also chest pain. So what we do next is we do color. So when we do color, what we wanted to see is we wanted to localize the obstruction. In some other case, uh, I will show you exactly step by step on how to measure the LVOT obstruction so that we don't make the mistake because if you notice here in apical four chamber view or five chamber view, you have LVOT obstruction here, but notice you also have micro regurgitation over there. And as you know, your continuous wave Doppler actually measure the highest velocity along the line of the ultrasound beam. So therefore, you must be very careful not to mistake the continuous wave Doppler because of the LVOT obstruction as opposed to the continuous wave Doppler because of the micro regurgitation. So how do you do that? So you do it step by step. What I normally do is I usually go straight to the micro regurgitation, put the continuous wave Doppler at the micro regurgitation and get the peak, the highest velocity there. Because the micro regurgitation highest velocity will always be higher than the LVOT obstruction. So, that, so therefore, when you go to the LVOT, you always have to expect that the peak velocity should be lower compared to the micro, micro regurgitation velocity. So that's the first step. The second step that I will do is, I will put a pulse wave Doppler at the point of obstruction and see aliasing because aliasing is where the velocity is the highest and then change to continuous wave Doppler. So that is the second step. After I change to continuous wave Doppler, and you look at the right side here, the third thing that I do to make sure that this is not an MRJ is, look at this, this Doppler actually late peaking. The peak is a bit later compared to the micro regurgitation peak, which is going to be parabolic. That's number one. Number two is a dynamic LVOT obstruction because of SAM. It does not involve the isovolumetric contraction and isovolumetric relaxation time. If you were to superimpose the micro regurgitation Doppler to the LVOT obstruction Doppler, you would see that the MR Doppler will go wider compared to the LVOT obstruction Doppler. Okay, so they are, there will be a few case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that I will share, and I will show you again and again how to approach this. And this is a typical example of a correct dynamic LVOT obstruction because of SAM. So you can see here the LVOT gradient before and during the salva maneuver. So you can see that even at rest, the peak gradient is 52.83 millimeter mercury. And at Vasalva, the peak gradient go up to 73.5 millimeter mercury. So why this is important? This is important because the definition of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy Remember that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does not necessarily be obstructive. You can have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy without obstruction. Okay. The definition of obstruction is when you measure and the gradient is more than 30 millimeter mercury, regardless whether it is at rest or it is at stress. Okay. 30 millimeter mercury. And the definition of significant obstruction is 50 millimeter mercury, okay, 30 for definition of obstruction and 50 millimeter mercury, the definition of significant obstruction. Okay, why is this important? This is important because if you have significant more than 50 millimeter mercury gradient across the LVOT and the patient is persistently symptomatic despite medical treatment, these patients are then the candidate for surgical myectomy or if they are not fit or they are not candidate, then they are candidate for alcohol septal ablation. All right. Now that is uh, just demonstrating the dynamic LVOT obstruction. It's very important in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy also to assess their diastology because you want to know whether the symptoms the patient having is because of diastolic dysfunction or not. In a patient with abnormal wall thickness, this patient has E over A of 1.05. So if you remember the algorithm of American Society of Echocardiography, they need to fulfill at least another two out of three criteria. 
which is the TRV max more than 2.8, the LAV more than 34 mils per meter squared, or the average E over E prime more than 14. And as you can see in this patient, the TRV max is more than 2.8, and you can see that the average E over E prime is more than 14. As you can see, the average E over E prime is 20.4. So now we know why the patient have shortness of breath. Even at rest, the patient have grade two diastolic dysfunction with elevated NP pressure. You can also see, and I think it is very important for you to look at the tissue Doppler, because tissue Doppler, I think is a very important surrogate in terms of answering whether the tissue of the heart is sick or not. As you can see here, the septal E prime is very low at 3.25, and lateral E prime at very low at 4.5. The threshold for septal E prime is seven, and the threshold for lateral E prime is 10. So the tissue is very sick here. So what is my thought about this first case that I show you about someone with shortness of breath? So what is this case? Is This is the case of reverse curvature hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this patient have abnormal wall thickness more than 1.5 centimeter. In terms of the type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, In terms of the type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we determine the type based on the appearance of the interventricular septum in the parasternal long axis view. Okay, and how they look is the definition. So a reverse curvature is one of the type. You also have neutral septum. You also have uh, sigmoid septum. So these are all the type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The wall thickness is one point four centimeter. Remember that upper limit for male is one point one. And upper limit for female is 1.0 centimeter. And there is a SAM in this patient with dynamic LVOT obstruction, but the SAM is due to posterior mitral valve lifted rather than anterior mitral valve lifted, still anterior motion of the mitral valve. So the obstruction is more than 30. In fact, in this patient, the obstruction is more than 50 millimeter mercury. So this is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So our first approach is to start with medical treatment. So usually what we do, is we give beta blockers for this patient. In a center that is uh, available, you can also use disopiramide. And if let's say the patient is still symptomatic despite medical treatment, what you can do is then you can go for surgical myectomy or alcohol septal ablation. Remember that the gold standard is surgical myectomy, not alcohol septal ablation, okay? So try as best as you can, unless the patient is not fit to go for surgical myectomy. This patient have shortness of breath at rest, and we know what is the reason. Number one, the wall thickness that is thick. Number two is the obstruction. And finally, the patient have grade two diastole dysfunction with increase in LA pressure. So this is, the, this is my first case. I wanted to show you a case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and how do we approach uh, such situation. Just one of the tips, okay? Anything that increase preload and increase afterload make the obstruction better. Anything that increase the preload and increase afterload make the obstruction better. That's why in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, you don't want to over diurize them. Because you over diurize them, you cause the preload to come down. Okay. On the other hand, anything that reduce the preload or reduce the afterload increase the obstruction. So you do not want to over diurize this patient. And in a patient that has SAM because of uh, anterior myocardial infarction, you do not want to put an intra aortic balloon pump because this will make the LV of T obstruction worse. All right. So that's the first case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now let's go to case two. My case two is a 61 years old male. So this is a case of, again, also someone that has shortness of breath at rest. Okay. So when you look at the parasternal long axis view, so the one thing that you can see here, number one, you can see that the aortic valve is thickened and calcified. You can see that the aortic valve opening is restricted. If you look at the mitral valve, 
the picture is not so clear. So you can't really tell whether there is any abnormality of the leaflet itself. However, if you look at the regurgitation, so you can see that they are regurgitation. But you can't really see any tail of the regurgitation. So the mitral regurgitation appeared to be ending just there. Okay. If you carefully look at the posterior leaflet here, you might be able to subtly look at some posterior leaflet prolapse, okay? which is tally with what we're talking about because this MR is anteriorly directed. The ejection fraction also depressed at 45%. So now is a zoom view of the aortic valve. Again, you can see the aortic valve is thickened and calcified. Now, this zoom view is very important. So every time you do and analyze echocardiography, make sure you look at the 2D view first and see whether you can identify any obvious abnormality before looking at the color. And you can see here that the non coronary cast appear immobile and the right coronary cast is thickened, calcified, and didn't open nicely. Again, if you're looking at the mitral valve here, you can see the suggestion of posterior mitral valve prolapse there. And you can see anteriorly directed mitral regurgitation there. Again, in the color view, we can also see aortic regurgitation there. Now, we zoom view the mitral valve again. And again, we see the possibility of the posterior mitral valve lifted prolapse here. I like to go to short axis view. Why do I like to go to the short axis view? Because this is the view when you put color where in majority of cases, not all of the cases, you can actually localize where does the regurgitation originate from. In this case, if you notice, the regurgitation originate from here. This is the mitral valve leaflet, anterior mitral valve leaflet, posterior mitral valve leaflet. So this is lateral and medial. So A1, A2, and A3, P1, P2, and P3 scallop. And because this show that the prolapse is posterior, and this show that it is at a 3 scallop, so from this transthoracic, we can guess that the origin of the prolapse is at a P3 segment of the mitral valve leaflet. So what we do here is, so this is the apical four chamber view. So in this apical four chamber view, again, you can see mitral regurgitation, but again, you cannot see the tail of that mitral regurgitation. It seems that the regurgitation ends somewhere there. Beware whenever you cannot see the tail. It does not mean that the mitral regurgitation is not significant. It just means that the mitral regurgitation is very eccentric, that you can't really get the jet when you do transthoracic echocardiogram. Okay? This left view is the attempt by the technologies to do PISA. What is PISA? PISA stands for Proximal Isovolumetric Surface Area. So this is a modification of the continuity equation, whereby we are trying to get the effective regurgitant orifice area and also regurgitant volume of that micro regurgitation. Why do we need to use PISA? Why don't we just use continuity equation? If you remember, we use continuity equation to measure aortic valve area. In that measurement of the aortic valve area, the LVOT is actually assumed to be circular. But because LVOT is assumed to be circular, you can do a direct continuity equation. Pi R squared times LVOT VTI equal to aortic valve area times aortic valve VTI. However, for mitral regurgitation, the surface of the mitral regurgitation is not circular. There are no geometrical assumptions that you can do for mitral regurgitation if you don't do PISA. The reason people do PISA is actually to get a hemisphere at the zone of flow conversion so that you can assume an, a geometrical shape to the flow conversion. And you can put a formula. And the formula is 2 pi r squared times aliasing velocity is equal to 
micro regurgitation max velocity times effective regurgitant orifice area. Okay. So in this situation, this technology is trying to do PISA. So they get a radius of 0 0.61 centimeter at a lysing velocity of 30.8 centimeter. What does this 30.8 centimeter per second mean? It just means that at this velocity, you are telling the machine to say that the color of the Doppler actually changes from yellow to blue. Okay. So we use this PISA radius of 0 0.61 and a lysing velocity of 30.8 centimeter per second. And we use the Doppler across the micro regurgitation to get the micro regurgitation velocity time integral, which is 155 centimeter. And we have the micro regurgitation max velocity, which is 575.5 centimeter per second. And therefore, when we rearrange the formula, we get the effective regurgitant orifice area of 0 0.13 centimeter squared and regurgitant volume of 19.4 mils. So the definition of severity when you do PISA, severe MR is EROA of more than 0 0.4 and regurgitant volume that is more than 60 mils. Moderate is EROA of more than 0 0.2 or regurgitant volume that is more than 40. And what is less than that is mild. So looking at this calculation here, what we might think is that this patient only have mild primary micro regurgitation. So is that true or not? Now, whenever I analyze someone with primary micro regurgitation, I always make sure that I calculate all using a good data. For example, in this patient, I felt that the PISA measurement is not correct. The PISA hemisphere is not perfect. Therefore, I am not very confident that the calculation is correct. Number two, as I mentioned before, when you have micro regurgitation, you always wanted to see where does the micro regurgitation end? Where does the tail of the micro regurgitation reach? In this situation, you can see that the micro regurgitation seems to end there. It seems to crowd the micro annulus. So this is very suspicious to me. This seems like a very eccentric micro regurgitation. So I got the feeling that our calculation is wrong, that this is not exactly my micro regurgitation. So now we go into the aortic valve. We get the continuous wave Doppler across the aortic valve. And you can see that this patient indeed have aortic stenosis. Remember, when you do measure for aortic stenosis, always use all the window that is available. Okay. And this is the LVOT VTI. And for aortic valve, we can use continuity equation, right? So our AV VTI is 66.6 centimeter. Our AV peak velocity is 3.53 meter per second. Mean gradient is 28 with LVOT VTI of 12 centimeter. When we calculate the aortic valve area, we get the aortic valve area of 0 0.57 centimeter squared, which is severe. However, our mean gradient is only 28. Now, a perfect severe aortic stenosis, a straightforward severe aortic stenosis, the mean gradient should be more than 40 and aortic valve area less than one. But in this case, the aortic valve area is less than one, but the mean gradient is less than 40. This is what we call low gradient severe aortic stenosis. The most important thing every time you will face with low gradient severe aortic stenosis is to make sure that you do not have any measurement error. And the sources of measurement error are number one, wrong measurement of LVOT diameter. Number two, wrong measurement of aortic valve Doppler, importantly missing or not doing right parasternal view. And lastly, wrong measurement of LVOT VTI. You can use your dimensionless index if your measurement is correct to double check your LVOT diameter. Okay, once you are absolutely sure, absolutely sure 
that your measurement is correct, then and only then you can say that someone has low gradient severe eye stenosis. After that, what you do is you get the patient stroke volume index because you wanted to classify. Is this a normal flow? Is it a low flow? In this patient, the stroke volume index is 22.2. Normal flow is between 35 to 65 mils per meter squared. I repeat, 35 to 65 mils per meter squared. So these patients are having classical because the ejection fraction is down, low flow because the stroke volume index is down, low gradient, low gradient, severe eye stenosis. In this situation, usually you need to do a low dose dobutamine stress echocardiogram to see whether this is a true severe eye stenosis or pseudo severe eye stenosis. So what is my thought on this case? Number one, this I think is, I'm quite confident that this patient actually having classical low flow, low gradient, severe eye stenosis. And my diagnosis index is also 0 0.18, which tally with severe eye stenosis. However, in terms of the mature regurgitation, number one, I already established that the MR is pan systolic. It's very important to establish this using color view. Because remember, many mitral valve prolapse, the MR is mid to late systolic. And almost never, if your MR is mid to late systolic, it is severe. Almost never. It always less than severe. But in this patient, the MR is pan systolic. And as I said, I cannot see the tail of the mitral regurgitation. So I'm very suspicious. Am I dealing with an eccentric jet here? So they don't do mitral inflow and pulmonary vein doper tracing. And another problematic thing about this patient is that the PISA, the, post, the, the proximal isovolumetric surface area is not satisfactory. And I cannot take the ROE of 0 0.13 and the digital volume of 19.4 mils as a correct reflection of the severity of the mitral regurgitation. So therefore, I do transesophageal echocardiogram for this patient. So this is the TEE finding for this patient. Okay. So this is a mid-esophageal four-chamber view. And this is a mid-esophageal bicommissural view. When you don't have 3D, these two views are important to determine which scallop is the pathology for the mitral valve. Now, let's go at the mid-esophageal four-chamber view. If you look at the mid-esophageal four-chamber view, we can see there is something, some mass that is fluttering inside the left atrium that seems to be attaching to the posterior mitral valve lifted. Okay. So now we can say that the pathology is actually at the posterior mitral valve lifted. When we look at the bicommissural view, remember bicommissural view from lateral to medial is P1, A2, and P3. And you can see that they are a mass that is attached to the three segment. Okay. I repeat. In mid-esophageal four-chamber view, you decide whether it is posterior or anterior lifted. We can see that this mass here that seems, I think is a ruptured cordae, is attached to the posterior lifted. Okay. This one is to determine whether it is at scallop number one, scallop number two, or scallop number three. And you can see that there is a match attached to the three scallop. So we combine this posterior and these three so we can localize that the problem comes from the P3 segment. So the flail segment here is actually from the P3. So rather than uh, P2, like what we suspect in transthoracic echocardiogram, it seems that this patient actually having P3 flail because of that ruptured cordae. Okay? In fact, when we go to back commercial view and I adjust a little bit the probe, you can see clearly this flail segment here. I show you that flail segment there. Okay, this is one, two, three. You can see that P3 flail, and you can see the jet that is very eccentric directed to the opposite direction. Now, this is mid esophageal long axis view. Now, in this mid esophageal long axis view, finally you can see how different it is the appearance 
of the MR of the transthoracic, which is a bit mild. We can't even see the tail. And this transesophageal, we can see that the MR is actually severe. Again, in this modified long axis view, again, you can see prolapse or flail of the P3 segment with a ruptured cordae there. So what is my final thought after this transesophageal echocardiogram? So this case, I think, shows the utility of the transesophageal echocardiogram to uncover the real MR severity. Okay, Don't be shy to do TE if you cannot answer from transthoracic echocardiogram. Why in this case, the transthoracic echocardiogram is unreliable? Few things. Number one, we can't really see where is the origin of the mitral defibrillation. Number two, the MR tail cannot be visualized because the MR is very eccentric. And number three, when you adjust the aliasing velocity, you cannot get a reliable PISA. So then your EROA and regression volume is also not reliable. In this situation, the PISA is not properly done. The radius is likely underestimated. And as I said, we can't really see the field segment. Very important when you do transthoracic echocardiogram to never miss a step or skip a step. Because in this study, there is no mitral inflow and pulmonary vein Doppler in transthoracic echocardiogram to support the diagnosis of severe mitral regurgitation. The TEE clearly shows that this patient has flail P3 segment of the mitral valve and obvious cooptation defect, suggesting we are dealing with severe mitral regurgitation. Furthermore, the color also appear to show severe primary mitral regurgitation. Our final diagnosis for our patient is classical low flow, low gradient severe aortic regurgitation, severe aortic stenosis, and also severe primary regurgitation. This patient underwent double valve replacement successfully. Having said that, I just wanted to remind uh, the audience, whenever you are dealing with severe primary mitral regurgitation, always try to repair rather than replace the valve if your center are able to do so. Remember that repair, replacing a repairable primary mitral regurgitation is unethical and it's also not doing justice for the patient. Again, repair, replacing, okay, replacing a repairable primary mitral regurgitation is not ethical. You have to repair if you can repair the primary mitral regurgitation. So that is case number two. So now we go to case number three. So here we have a 26 years old female. Okay. So in this 26 years old female, in the case note, it was noted that this patient have rheumatic aortic valve disease. Okay, rheumatic aortic valve disease. So this is the parasternal long axis view. If you can see parasternal long axis view here that the LV is dilated. Remember that the upper limit for diastolic dimension for female is 5.2 centimeter and for male is 5.8 centimeter. So in this patient, she is a female. So 5.54. Even her systolic dimension is also dilated at 4.01. Systolic dimension for female is 3.5, for male is 4 centimeter. Now, this patient was labeled as having rheumatic valvular heart disease. But when you look at the mitral valve, surprisingly, there are no signs that this patient has rheumatic mitral valve disease. The anterior mitral valve leaflet appear to be moving freely. There are no diastolic doming of the mitral valve leaflet, and the leaflet tips does not appear to be thickened or calcified. So I think that they are mistake here. I don't think that this patient have rheumatic valvular heart disease. Why is the LV dilated? Now, if you look at the image on the right side here, you can see why. We can see the patient have aortic regurgitation. We can see the patient have aortic regurgitation. Okay. Whenever we see IoT regurgitation, it is very important to look at 2D images first and after that to look at color. Okay, why is this important? I will show in the next image. 
So this is a zoom view. When we're dealing with IT regurgitation, it is very important to look at 2D without looking at color. Why? Because you wanted to see your leaflets. Your leaflet appear normal or not normal. Okay. Is the leaflet classified ticket? Because that also can cause IIT regurgitation because it causes restriction in IoT path closure. Is there any perforation of the IoT path? Is there any signs of infective endocarditis by your 2D images? Okay, and we can see that the IoT valve is opening well, so there is no thickening and classification. So definitely, this is not rheumatic. Next, we go at the color view. Now, the color is very important because you wanted to see the direction of the IoT vegetation, because the direction of the IoT vegetation might give you a suggestion of what is the reason of that IoT vegetation. In this patient, the regurgitation jet is directed eccentrically towards the anterior mitral valve leaflet, okay? Eccentric towards here. So we have eccentric aortic regurgitation. So what can cause eccentric aortic regurgitation? Now, central aortic regurgitation is usually caused by, for example, aortic valve thickening, degenerative aortic valve disease, or rheumatic aortic valve disease. When you have aortic root dilatation, or you have sinus or valve dilatation, sinus tubular junction direct dilatation or root dilatation, you can also have central aortic regurgitation. When you have eccentric aortic regurgitation like this, the most common cause is prolapse of the leaflet away from the jet. Okay, so in this patient, my first thinking is that we are dealing with prolapse of the right coronary cusp. Okay, or if the patient having bicuspid valve, prolapse of the fused leaflet of the bicuspid IoT valve. Now, I show you this freeze view here because I wanted to show you a very a perfect way to measure vena contracta. You go bit by bit and you try to find two convergent, one blue in color and one red in color. And when you get this, the line in between this, that is your vena contracta. And in this patient, the vena contracta is 6.1 millimeter, more than 6 millimeter. So we are dealing with severe IoT regurgitation, likely due to prolapse of the right coronary cusp. I cannot prove it yet because I cannot see the prolapse segment yet. Now, in short axis view, however, now I can confirm the diagnosis of prolapse RCC. Look at here. On the left side, you can see trileaflet IoT buff. If this is interatrial septum, that is your non-coronary cusp, that is your left coronary cusp, and that is your right coronary cusp. You can see here that your right coronary cusp does not go out as well as your non and left. Okay, again, you can look at this. The right doesn't go up as well as the non and left coronary cusp. And you can see the origin of the aortic vegetation there. Now we have apical five chamber view. The patient have preserved ejection fraction. This is the non-coronary cast, and that is the right coronary cast. Again, I cannot see any obvious prolapse of flail. I do see that eccentric jet directed towards the anterior mitral valve lifter. Now, I put the continuous wave Doppler across the IoT path, and you can see the diastolic color Doppler here. A lot, some very common confusion that people that do echocardiogram do is that they look at this and they say the pressure half time is wrong. Therefore, this is not severe aortic regurgitation. That is wrong, okay? In chronic aortic regurgitation, in chronic severe aortic regurgitation, we often time severe aortic regurgitation with prolonged pressure half time, okay? The short pressure half time is not sensitive for chronic severe aortic regurgitation, all right? In most chronic severe AR, the pressure half time is in fact longer than 190 milliseconds. Only in acute severe IIT regurgitation that you have short pressure half time. I also like to do M mode across the mitral valve in IIT regurgitation. Why? Because this is very, uh, very uh, important because we can see the opening of the mitral valve. And sometimes in patients with very severe IIT regurgitation, 
we can see premature closure of the mitral valve before the start of diastole. Okay, because the LV EDP is so high. In fact, in very severe ICD agitation, not only you have premature closure of the mitral valve, you also have premature opening of the aortic valve. Finally, okay, so this I just, I think just show you how important it is when you look at echocardiogram to really look properly at your 2D images. And if you do properly, most of the time you can get answer by looking at 2D. In fact, when you zoom at this aortic valve, finally you can see here that the RCC is prolapsing. That is the NCC. And you can see here the RCC is prolapsing. Even though in many windows we cannot see, but finally here we can see that the RCC is prolapsed. So therefore we get a definitive analysis of IoT vegetation here. And the AR is severe. Not only the vena contracta is more than six millimeter, you can also see here, this is the descending iota, left sub subclavian, left common carotid artery. You can see hollow diastolic flow reversal in the descending iota. And not only that, you also see hollow diastolic reversal in the abdominal iota. So hollow diastolic flow reversal in the abdominal iota is very specific for severe iotic regurgitation. So what I thought about this third case here. So this patient was given diagnosis of rheumatic valve disease. But again, almost always, if you have rheumatic valve, it will affect mitral valve. But they are nothing on the mitral valve. In fact, they don't even classification and thickening of the aortic valve. It's very important to use 2D to look at the leaflet itself. We can see that the leaflet opening is good. However, the color, the jet is eccentric and directed to AMVL. And when we're dealing with eccentric AR, it's either we are dealing with prolapse or flame of the leaflet, or sometimes a patient with sinus of valsalva rupture can also have eccentric aortic regurgitation. In this case, we look at many, many views and we cannot see the prolapse segment, but because we are very careful, finally, on the last view, on the zoom apical five chamber view, we can see clearly that the patient have RCC prolapse. In fact, RCC prolapse is one of the commonest cause of IIT regurgitation. Okay. Another common cause of IIT regurgitation is someone with bicuspid aortic valve and the fused liquid actually, the fused liquid actually prolapse. So if you have bicuspid with fused RCC and LCC, this fused liquid can prolapse and cause aortic regurgitation. And in terms of severity, there are a few markers that show this AR is severe. Namely, a vena contracta that is more than 6 mm. And importantly, hollow diastolic flow reversal even in the abdominal iota. So basically, we are dealing with a 26 years old female with severe AR secondary to prolapse like for class. Importantly, they are different way of approaching severe aortic regurgitation compared to severe primary mitral regurgitation. In severe primary mitral regurgitation, we are usually very aggressive, i.e. we try to intervene before the onset of LV decompensation. Therefore, in primary severe mitral regurgitation, even if the EF is preserved, even if the patient is asymptomatic, if we are able to do a successful repair, we will send the patient for mitral valve repair. But for severe IT regurgitation, it is opposite. For severe IT regurgitation, many, many times the patients are relatively young. Many, many times they can withstand severe AR for a long time before they start becoming symptomatic. So in severe AR, you only intervene A, if the patient is symptomatic, and B, if there are signs of LV decompensation, i.e., one, EF of less than 55%, LV systolic dimension more than 5 cm, LV and systolic dimension index more than 20 mm per meter square. So that is the numbers that one have to remember. So as long as patient is asymptomatic and there is no evidence of LV decompensation, we can still wait. The threshold for LV decompensation is 
I show you, you and I speak about it already. So in our patient, the biplan EF is already down at 54%. So this patient is already indicated for aortic valve replacement. So now we go to case number four. So this is our pen ultimate case for tonight. So the first case, we touch on thick wall cardiomyopathy. So thick wall cardiomyopathy is someone that have wall thickness that is abnormal. Normally, we take wall thickness more than 1.5 centimeter normally, but actually wall thickness that is more than 1.3 centimeter is already abnormal. Unless the patient have, for example, hypertension or aortic stenosis, where they might be able to have wall thickness more than 1.3 centimeter. So I have Indonesian man that see me, he's 68 years old, he come with progressive shortness of breath. So this is her parasternal long axis view. If you look at the parasternal long axis view, we can see that the patient has asymmetrical wall thickness. So the interventricular septum is very thick, 1.8 cm. However, the posterior wall is normal, 0.8 cm. So this is asymmetrical wall thickness. So whenever I see abnormal wall thickness, my differential diagnosis is number one, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, number two, cardiac amyloidosis, and number three, Anderson's fibrillary disease, as long as they don't have hypertension or aortic stenosis. This patient obviously does not have aortic stenosis. And as I told you already, I think this patient also don't have hypertension. Furthermore, IVSD that is 1.8 centimeter is very rare, even if the patient have hypertension and aortic stenosis. One thing that might point towards hypertrophic cardiomyopathy here is the fact that the wall thickness is asymmetrical, the interventricular septum is bigger than the posterior wall, but this patient does not have SEM. This patient also has mitral regurgitation, and we can see that the appearance of the LV wall is somehow bright. It seems to me somehow bright. Another thing that is important to see, this patient is also in atrial fibrillation. Why is that important? Because we can see that the patient has mitral regurgitation, and a chronic atrial fibrillation can also cause mitral regurgitation. This is what we call AFMR, or atrial functional mitral regurgitation. The mitral regurgitation appear moderate to severe. If you look at short axis view, it appeared to occupy the whole of mitral valve, from lateral to the medial. There are no tainting, there is no flail or prolapse, there is no calcification. And because of the chronic atrial fibrillation, I think this is most likely atrial functional mitral regurgitation. When we look at apical four chamber view, again, I am struck by the fact that the wall is appear bright and sparkling. I think that the interatrial septum is somewhat thickened. The patient have mitral regurgitation, and there is also thickening of the right ventricle wall. So again, increasing my suspicion that this patient having thick wall cardiomyopathy. And with biatrial dilatation and the patient age and atrial fibrillation, now I'm starting to think, does this patient also have cardiac amyloidosis? Or is this cardiac amyloidosis? Or is this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? This patient has secondary tricuspid regurgitation. We can see that the tricuspid regurgitation peak velocity is more than 2.8 meter per second, suggesting that the LPA pressure is elevated. And in apical long axis view, we can see that the E over A is fused because the patient has atrial fibrillation. The patient has fairly short dislocation time of 99.5 milliseconds. The patient's septal E prime is 5.9 centimeter per second. The lateral E prime is 11.9 centimeter per second. And the septal E over E prime is elevated at 12.4. Remember, in patients with atrial fibrillation, rather than using average E over E prime, we can actually use septal E over E prime. So in this case, the septal E over E prime is more than 11. So what we are dealing with, patient, this patient also has increase in LA pressure, the combination of diastolic dysfunction and mitral regurgitation. So now I'm actually in a dilemma in terms of diagnosis. Is this patient have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or this patient have cardiac amyloidosis? However, when I do a global longitudinal strain, it's very helpful because when I look at the bull eyes here, I can see that it appears that the infiltrative process affects 
more the mid and the basal segment rather than the ectal segment. We have appearance suggestive of cherry on top appearance of apical sparing. That is very typical of cardiac aneurysis. In fact, there are this calculation, we call it relative apical sparing. We take the average of the apical strain, we divide by the summation of the average mid segment and basal strain. If it's more than one, meaning that you have apical sparing. In this patient, it is borderline, it's 0 0.97, it is almost one. So, because of that, right, few things bright myocardium, very thickened wall, biatrial dilatation, involvement of the RV wall, atrial fibrillation, mitral regurgitation. So cardiac amyloidosis is high in my differential diagnosis. Whenever cardiac amyloidosis is high in your differential diagnosis, it is very important to get the diagnosis as soon as you can. If you can, within one week. Why? Because there are two types of cardiac amyloidosis. One is AL amyloidosis or light chain amyloidosis. The other one is TTR amyloidosis or transthyretin amyloidosis. AL amyloidosis is a very bad disease. The patient can die while waiting for the diagnosis to be made. So therefore, if you suspect the patient of having cardiac amyloidosis, the first thing you have to do is you have to send serum and urine electrophoresis and immunoprecession and serum free light chain urgently to rule out AL amyloidosis. Okay, and one more time, you have to send serum and urine electrophoresis with immunofixation and serum free light chain urgently to rule out AL amyloidosis. So in this patient here, so this is the result of the patient, elect serum electrophoresis and immunofixation, and the result is negative. So this patient does not have monoclonal antibody. When we look at the free light chain, again, there are no increase in either lambda free light chain or kappa free light chain. So we are ruling out AL amyloidosis. Why is it important to rule out AL amyloidosis? This is because if you have AL amyloidosis, when you do your PYP scanning, when you do your PYP scanning to check for TTR amyloidosis, it can get a false positive result. Okay? So imagine you have someone that you suspect of having cardiac amyloidosis, you didn't send for serum electrophoresis and also free light chain. You straight away go for PYP scanning and PYP come back positive. But now you don't know. Are we dealing with TTR or AL amyloidosis? Okay. So this patient, I rule out AL amyloidosis. And after that, I send the patient for PYP. So PYP is a bone scan or pyrophosphate scanning. So this is the diagnostic modality to diagnose TTR amyloidosis. So what we wanted to see is we wanted to see increased uptake of pyrophosphate in the heart compared to the contralateral lung. In my patient, however, the result is unfortunately equivocal. The quantitative grading is only 1.34, meaning that the uptake in the heart divide the uptake in the contralateral lung is only 1.34. But one of the possibility is that this represents early stage of TTR amyloidosis. Okay, so this, I just wanted to show you in this case of how is my approach in someone with thick wall cardiomyopathy. So whenever someone with presented heart failure symptoms, I'm thinking of FREF or FREF. So this patient had rejection fraction of 48.4%. But what strikes me strongly is the wall thickness that is very thick, 1.8. Remember, Male should not be more than 1.1 and females should not be more than 1.0. Okay. Even if you're athletes, it should not be more than 1.3 centimeter. If you have hypertension and IT stenosis, it can be, but rarely go beyond 1.5. So if you see anyone with wall thickness more than 1.5, think about three things: hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 
cardiac amyloidosis and Anderson's fibril disease. In this patient, the ECG is normal. Even though we were thought that patient with cardiac amyloidosis, they will have a small QRL complex, remember that up to 25% of patients with cardiac amyloidosis can have a normal electrocardiogram. So now I'm thinking about thick wall cardiomyopathy. One thing that points towards hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the asymmetrical thickness of the interventricular septum compared to the posterior wall. But there is a lot of things that points towards amyloid. The sparkling myocardium, the bi dilatation, the pericardial effusion, the apical sparing. The epigen also does not have SAM. Remember I said that SAM is suggestive of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it is not exclusive for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can have SAM in amyloid. You can even have SAM in hypertensive heart disease. Have SAM in takut sumbu cardiomyopathy. So what did I do? So first and five foremost is I rule out AL amyloidosis because this is medical emergency. So I rule out AL amyloidosis. I send the serum free light chain, serum and urine electrophoresis and immunofixation. All of which are negative. So I'm able to rule out AL amyloid. Once I rule out AL amyloid, then I do pyrophosphate scanning. If the result is positive, not equivocal, you can straight away diagnose TTR. Remember, for TTR amyloid, you don't, you don't need biopsy if your pyrophosphate scanning is positive. In AL amyloid, you need biopsy, but does not necessarily from the heart. So in all patients with thick wall cardiomyopathy, and for this patient at the time, so what I do for this patient is actually do cardiac MRI. When I do cardiac MRI, I already gotten the results. I haven't updated it in this slide. So yes, this patient does have cardiac amyloidosis. In the cardiac MRI, it shows diffuse subendocardium lead gadolinium enhancement, which is very typical of cardiac amyloidosis. So I diagnose this patient as TTR amyloidosis. And as you know, nowadays, we already have treatment for TTR amyloidosis, even though it is very, very expensive. So in terms of my thought for this pen ultimate case, so it is illustrate sometimes may see day-to-day -day dilemma when we see someone with thick wall to separate whether this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, amyloid, or is this just hypertensive cardiomyopathy. We have a case where there are many echocardiographic parameters points towards cardiac amyloidosis, but also points against cardiac amyloidosis in this situation. We are able to rule out AL, but QIP scanning is equivocal, but I do cardiac MRI, and it shows diffuse subendocardial fibrosis. So I think this is TTR amyloidosis. So this is my last case, last case for today. So this is our case number five. In this patient, we are dealing with assessing aortic me uh, mechanical or bioprospective valve. We have here an 82 years old female with aortic valve replacement done in 1999. So more than 20 years. Patients have some exertional dyspnea, but when they do echocardiogram, you see that across the aortic valve, the peak velocity is very high at 4.5 meter per second. And the mean gradient is 48.96 millimeter mercury. Why? Is this obstruction meaning that the AVR is gone? Are we dealing with patient prostatic mismatch? Are we dealing with high flow? Or are we dealing with concomitant aortic regurgitation? So this is the patient, right? Okay, so this is the parasternal long axis view. Again, important to just look at 2D image first. The patient have abnormal wall thickness, not surprisingly, because I'm sure this patient have aortic stenosis before. We can see here that this patient have mechanical aortic bar. How do I know? Because you can see the shadow from the mechanical aortic bar here. Right, so this is 23 years after her operation. Whenever I assess mechanical bar, I look 2D first. I need to see is there any obvious thickening or calcification? Is there any obvious abnormality? I look at the color, is there any obvious regurgitation? So, this is a zoom axis view again. I cannot see any obvious abnormality here of the mechanical aortic valve. We can see some micro cavitation, which is a normal finding in patients with mechanical aortic valve. I measure the LVOT diameter of 1.86 cm because I wanted to measure the aortic valve area. 
color is very important, especially in mechanical aortic valve. I wanted to make sure there is no concomitant aortic regurgitation because a concomitant aortic regurgitation can explain why a gradient of velocity across the aortic valve is high. There is turbulent flow across aortic valve, but this is normal for prosthetic aortic valve. So, so far in 2D view, I cannot see any obvious abnormality. When we look at the short axis view, unfortunately, in this patient, you can see that the mitral valve opening is not good. You can see that there is anterolateral and posteromedial commissional fusion. So this patient, when we do planimetry of 1.3 centimeters square, this patient have rheumatic mitral stenosis. ACC guideline has been updated. So now less than 1.5 is considered severe. So patient have severe rheumatic mitral stenosis. So when you look at apical long axis view, we can see the patient have mitral stenosis and some mitral regurgitation. I'm sure most of you know, but for those of you who don't know, rheumatic mitral valve disease can also cause mitral regurgitation. Okay, this is Carpentier 3A. We look at apical long axis view. Again, we interrogate, is there any obvious regurgitation? Is there any obvious abnormalities? Again, there is no obvious abnormalities. And now we do the Doppler. We do the continuous wave Doppler across the white IT valve and we do LVOT Doppler, all right? Just like what we do for native aortic valve. Why is this important for aortic valve? For aortic valve, if you are assessing prosthetic aortic valve, when you do Doppler, you want it to be triangular, okay? Triangular. You do not want it to be parabolic. A triangular Doppler showing that the valve is opening well. A parabolic Doppler showing that the valve is obstructed. Because it is triangular, the acceleration time is also should be short. When I say short, less than 100 millisecond. Okay? So in this patient, at the first glance, we can see that the Doppler appeared triangular. The acceleration time is short at 89 millisecond. So a triangular Doppler and short acceleration time is a marker of normally functioning IIT valve, right? We can see that the AV VTI is 93.6 centimeter. The mean gradient is 49. In fact, when you do IIT valve area, it is 0 0.67 centimeter square. It's very, very small. And when we index to body space area, it is 0 0.56 centimeter square per meter square. The dimensions index is 0 0.25. So for dimensions index, if it's more than 0 0.25, it's likely normal IT valve. If it's less than 0 0.25, it's like uh, it's less than 0 0.25, it's likely to be abnormal. So in this patient, it's just on the dot and 0 0.25. However, looking at the Doppler and looking at the expression time, I suspect that we are dealing with a normally functioning IT valve. So what is my overall comment on this echocardiogram? This is very important, yeah? The appearance of the AVR is unremarkable. Importantly, there are no obvious aortic regurgitation. Another important thing is the Doppler is triangular with short extension time of 89 milliseconds, even though the dimensionless index is borderline at 0 0.25. AVA is very, very small at 0 0.67 centimeters squared and the index is 0 0.56 centimeters squared per meter squared. However, apart from the dimensionless index, the 2D appearance and Doppler all points toward patient prosthetic mismatch. So shall I stop that? Do, or am I brave enough to stop and say that this patient have patient prosthetic mismatch? So normally, okay, I don't determine whether the valve is functioning normally or not, just based on one echo. I always, always, if it's available compared to baseline echo, echo that the patient had after they have the operation, okay? So what follows are the patient echo on the 2nd of December, 2010, 12 years ago, okay? So this echo 12 years ago show exactly the same thing for the aortic valve. The mitral valve, of course, they are now severe mitral stenosis, but if you look at the aortic valve, similar. The AVR is functioning well. There is no aortic regurgitation. Again, when you look at the apical five-chamber view, 
normal opening of the aortic valve, no significant aortic regurgitation. And Doppler that is done 12 years ago, okay, 12 years ago, we already have a peak velocity of 5.24. In fact, our current aortic valve have lower peak velocity. Our current aortic valve have lower mean gradient, okay. The aortic valve area at the time is 0 0.70 and aortic valve area index is 0 0.59 centimeters squared per meter squared. So let's compare 12 years ago and now. Peak velocity are actually coming down from 5 to 4.5. The mean gradient actually coming down from 65 to 49. The Doppler is triangular both. The dimensionless index is almost the same. The acceleration time is less now. And the aortic valve area index is almost the same. In fact, the hemodynamic is almost better now compared to them 12 years ago. So with comparison to baseline echo, now we can say for 100% sure, 100% that this patient does not have any aortic valve issue. But what she has is only patient prosthetic dismiss, i.e. the valve that were put at the time of surgery itself is too small for the patient. Okay, The definition of too small is Less than 0 0.85 centimeters squared per meter squared is considered PPM, and less than 0 0.65 centimeters squared per meter squared is considered severe patient prosthetic distress. And my thought for this final case, I think this case shows the approach for AVR dysfunction. It is vital to look at 2D appearance, look at the leaflet prosthetic appearance and movement. Is there any obvious clots or penis and any obvious regurgitation? Look at Doppler number, but also appearance. Remember, triangular is normal. Parabolic is abnormal. And most importantly, almost, in, almost indispensable, not dispensable, indispensable is to compare with baseline echocardiogram, which in this case established that this patient indeed have patient prosthetic mismatch rather than aortic valve dysfunction. So I finished five cases that I wanted to share today. Just to recap, our first case is someone with uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and posterior mitral valve leaflet SAM. I think our second case is someone with at first thought to have mild primary mitral regurgitation, but turned out to have severe mitral regurgitation. I think our third case is uh, someone with aortic regurgitation because of flail right coronary cast. Our fourth case is someone with thick wall cardiomyopathy. And our fifth case is someone with um, assessment of mechanical or bioprosthetic aortic valve. So I thank you so much uh, for your attention today. And we will do some more sharing next week. So I'm very happy to answer uh, any question if you want in the chat book, in the chat room. Thank you so much. So is there any question you can uh, type in the chat chat box? Or if you want to ask, uh, you know, with your microphone also can. All right, so if there is no question, uh, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, hopefully, I can see all of you again next week. Thank you so much.